Hey mamas, Alexandria here, 34 year old toddler mom, therapist, and gym rat. I lost nearly 40 pounds postpartum and it changed my life. And so my goal is now to help inspire other women to change their lives and motivate them so that they can do the same. But my story is linked in a card in case you'd like to go and have a watch to see what I'm all about. Today though, I'm gonna put on my therapist cap as well as my, you know, fitness nut top really, um, hat to discuss the latest episode of Jacqueline's Journey, which is I stopped drinking for 90 days and this is what happened. So. I watched this video and I had a, a lot of thoughts. So, if you guys are ready, let's get started. In case you don't know, I'll keep this very brief because most of you probably know who Jaclyn Hill is if you're watching this video. But basically, Jaclyn Hill is one of the OG beauty YouTubers and I've been following her story for a long time, partly because I used to make beauty content over on this channel and no longer a beauty channel, but I'm still interested in following her story and as you probably know, there's been a lot of controversy around her and her life. And so I've been following along as one does who's interested in these kinds of things. And so I decided to give this video a watch and I had a lot of thoughts. So let's get into the first clip, shall we? I partied, I drank alcohol socially, that was it, right? I was not sitting at home by myself drinking, I was not getting drunk on a regular basis, you know what I'm saying? I was young, I was having fun with my friends, I was just drinking like everybody else, right? Then I went through, <sighs> immediately my chest gets tight. I don't wanna dive into it too much, you guys, but when I launched my lipsticks, that was the worst time of my entire life. And during that time, I turned to alcohol. I've been very transparent about this in other episodes of Jacqueline's Journey. And then I stopped talking about it because I started getting so many comments. I started getting so many opinions. So in this first clip, Jacqueline is sort of touching on some of the drama that she's been through, particularly her lipstick launch, which again is a whole nother topic for a whole nother day. Did I try said lipsticks? Yes, there's actually a video on my channel and I was pregnant but hadn't announced it yet. So I sort of panicked when I found out that there was a potential contaminant in the lipsticks, but Anyway, so was I a victim to this little, you know, scandal, drama, whatever? Yes, I was. And <clears throat> it is interesting to sort of hear her talk about it. She does mention later on in the video that she did seek professional help to work through this trauma. But as sometimes people will do, and is not uncommon, she started to self-medicate with alcohol. There are a lot of people who do this, unfortunately, and I think she speaks to the sort of cultural norm around alcohol consumption and all those sort of things. I don't know about other parts of the world, but I know here in America, it's, you know, pretty culturally like normal. You're kind of weird if you don't drink alcohol, which I don't think is right. I don't think it's fair, but it is interesting that people will have a tendency to sort of call out people who aren't drinking as opposed to people who are. So it makes the idea of self-medicating when you're dealing with something like trauma, the kind of idea that you want to go to. Thankfully, we seem to be in a shift where people are recognizing that there doesn't need to be a mental health stigma and that mental health therapy and going to counseling is the way to go if you're dealing with something that's been really difficult for you. And she talks about some tightness in her chest, which is anxiety. It's one of her physical symptoms of anxiety. So I imagine she still gets quite anxious when she talks about this kind of stuff because she's she's gone through a lot of backlash and rightfully so. But we won't get into all the nitty gritty of her her scandal today because that's not what this video is for but it is interesting to see that all of this started because of trying to manage and deal with her stress so let's keep going he drinks you know what i'm saying so after i balanced out let me say balanced out my relationship with alcohol right i was no longer using it to self-medicate i was no longer using it to run at least that's what i thought right i got to a place where i was eating healthy i was going to bed at a good time i was working out i had lost i think i lost like 10 pounds or so 10 to 12 pounds i'm pretty sure i could look at my app to tell you for sure but i lost like 10 to 12 pounds and it was hard work like it was not easy because again i was still drinking was i drinking you know heavily no but i was still consuming alcohol so in this next part and this is where my little fitness hat is going to come on as well so in this part she's talking about sort of the impacts on her fitness journey because she was still passively and socially drinking alcohol even though she had moved past some of the addictive um, challenges that she was dealing with before but what's interesting is that alcohol impacts our entire system i'll actually i'm going to link some academic articles for you down below in case you want to read them for yourself i like way nerded out on this stuff and it was a lot of fun actually um so if you want to read those i'll link them for you but <clears throat> 
one of the articles I was reading was basically just talking about like all the different ways that alcohol impacts each and every system within your body. So when you consume alcohol, it's not, you know, if you get buzzed or whatever the case may be, it's not just impacting your brain, it's, it's impacting your entire body. And so while yes, losing weight can be challenging, it certainly can be, by still drinking alcohol, it was probably impacting her on multiple levels. One of those levels probably being the fact that she was having, you know, more calories in her calorie budget. Most alcohol has a lot of calories and it doesn't take a lot to have a lot of calories. And when you're adding in, you know, 100, 200, 300, 400 extra calories, depending on how much you're drinking in a day, then you have blown out your calorie budget and then you have to reassess. So that was probably one of the reasons why she was having such a hard time. The other thing that's interesting to know about alcohol is that alcohol also impacts your recovery as well as <clears throat> it impacts your ability to process protein. So when you're trying to build muscle, you're making micro tears in those muscles and you get protein, you eat protein so that you can rebuild those muscles and grow those muscles. But the problem is, is that alcohol reduces your ability to synthesize that protein into the muscle. So it makes it not as efficient with the amount of protein. So like, let's say you're drinking right after a workout or the same day as you did a hard workout, your muscles aren't able to take and use all the protein, like the protein supplements or, you know, all the proteins that you're eating and using to put it towards the muscular gains. So not only are you not losing weight necessarily, you're also not helping your gains. And then again, that recovery component, right? Like alcohol impacts your recovery recovery, particularly as you age. And so <clears throat> the alcohol that she was intaking was probably impacting her ability to get motivated to get up and go and to be able to work out as hard as she possibly could because of all the different like processes that were going on in the body as her body is trying to process all of this alcohol. All right. We'll keep going. If you are enjoying this content for me, please make sure that you click the subscribe button so you don't miss out on future content and support from this community. Like I was working out consistently five days a week, you know, just like life was good. So then for my birthday, it was my 33rd birthday. My husband and I, Jordan, we went to New York. He surprised me with a trip to New York. We went to New York. We were there for like three days. And while we were there in New York, I drank a lot, right? It's like, it's my birthday. We went and saw Drake. We bar hopped and I was drinking. Jordan is not a big drinker. And when I say big drinker, I mean like Jordan like never drinks. Okay, like rarely, rarely drinks. It takes him one beer and he's like, oh my God, I'm so buzzed. And I'm like, ah! So in this clip, she's talking about a trip to New York that she took for her 33rd birthday. So with her being 33, it's something that's interesting to note and also important to note and when you think about alcohol consumption and its impacts on the body is that as we age, our ability to metabolize the alcohol slows down. Therefore, what you can handle when you're drinking at 21 and you know, like those early like college days and stuff like that, as you progress in age, you'll notice that your body has a harder time metabolizing that alcohol and therefore, it, you, in, you end up ingesting more of it, essentially, so you can get drunker faster, which I guess is a good thing. I don't know. You tell me. But <clears throat> what it means is that, you know, the amount of alcohol that you drink, you know, on one occasion when you're 22 is not going to affect you the same when you're in your 30s. And I can attest to being in my 30s and drinking alcohol is not the same. It's just not the same. And part of that is having a toddler who doesn't care you know, what time it is, like he's ready to get up. Um, he's currently not napping, but anyway. But <clears throat> my point being is that as we age, our the ability for us to, you know, metabolize that alcohol slows way down. And so as you age, you're not able to drink as much without it having as big of an impact on your body. Okay, let's continue. Sorry, I've been interrupted. So if I moved, that's why. Uh, <clears throat> so let's keep going. Okay. Not only was I drinking, but I was drinking whatever I wanted. Like typically I would keep it clean because of my goals, right? Like I was working out, I was eating well. So when I did drink, I would just drink vodka soda with lime, like no sugar whatsoever. Cause I was like, that's clean. Yeah, there's no such thing. It's poison. That's what I've learned now. So interestingly in this segment, she talks about the sort of notion of clean alcohol and she's absolutely right from what she has learned. There's no such thing as clean alcohol. As we've discussed, it impacts our entire bodily system and everything that we 
we've got going on. So it is interesting that she sort of discusses it in the notion of like, well, I was drinking whatever I wanted versus, you know, drinking like the cleaner drinks. And I guess, you know, in some ways when you think about it from like a calorie budget perspective, right, those really sugary drinks like a margarita or a sangria or something along those lines are going to have more sugars, but there's also sugar in alcohol. And so, you know, you're not avoiding sugar altogether. And when you're consuming alcohol, it's still, there are still calories in all of the kinds of alcohol. So I guess if you're looking at things from a calorie budget perspective, then perhaps, yes, it's a lower dent in your calorie budget to be drinking a tonic and a vodka tonic or whatever uh, and things like that. But at the end of the day, like we talked about before, all of those other impacts are still coming into play. So it doesn't really matter. And <clears throat> when you think about, you know, Drinking overall, it's going to impact your gains overall. All right, my friends, let's keep going. Shut up. I was having a good time. So I got home, I weighed myself, and I was like, oh my God, I had to weigh myself in several weeks. So in that time frame, I had gained 12 pounds. And I was like, I'm sorry. We did not just gain back everything that we lost. Like, I worked so hard. And you know, if you're someone watching this and you've been on a weight loss journey while still drinking, you know how much harder it is. It, it is so hard to lose 10 pounds, even not drinking alcohol, but while consuming alcohol, you know, every weekend and, you know, throughout the week. So then for me to see that all that weight came back, I was like, and that was my moment. In this part, she's talking about coming back from her trip and then stepping on the scale and noticing that she gained all of this weight back. Well, for starters, she probably didn't actually gain all of the weight back, there's a pretty good chance that some of the weight that she gained back has to do with inflammation as well as water retention. Because when you go from not drinking as much or drinking like less sugary stuff, you're gonna, when you go to doing something that's like higher calorie and things like that, you're gonna bloat more, especially if you go from drinking less often to more often, you know, in a short period of time, you're gonna have higher water retention and higher inflammation. And so there is a chance that some of that weight she did gain back just from consuming more calories in her calorie budget over the course of time. When you think about, you know, like if you've got two or three margaritas or whatever, you know, those are probably like, you know, four or 500 calories a pop, I don't know, give or take, depending on what kind you use and if you go skinny and all those sort of things. But I can, I'll find a number and I'll put it on the screen. But depending on, you know, whatever you're drinking, right, that's going to add up in terms of the calories that you're intaking overall. So there's a good chance that she did gain some of that weight back. But what she's not taking into account is the inflammation and the water weight. And that's why it's a really important that while the scale is a valuable tool in a weight loss journey, it's not the be all end all. And the scale doesn't tell you a lot of things. There's a lot of missing information that the scale cannot provide for you. And that number is in fact just a number. Your body composition and the, you know, the things that you are doing while you're on your weight loss journey have a lot more impact than those numbers on the scale. Because you could be someone who has a leaner body composition, weigh 130 pounds, to someone who has more fat content and they're gonna still weigh 130 pounds. Those two are not created equal. But the number on the scale looks exactly the same. So don't just utilize the scale, and this is for Jacqueline as well, don't utilize the scale as just a num, you know, as what it is. Like it's just a number, let it be a guide for you, but don't let it discourage you from your goals because there's a lot of information that the scale cannot provide for you. All right, so moving on. After my birthday, I was like, I'm done. I looked at Jordan and I said, I don't want to drink anymore. I felt depressed. It's like every morning I opened my eyes and I had to like crawl out of this sinkhole of depression. And I'm not even talking about having a hangover. I'm talking about this is just the state that I was living in. And I was at that point where I was just about to film my video announcing that I was closing down my businesses. And I was just so overwhelmed by that. And I'm just like, oh, nothing makes sense. I'm so sick of being so foggy and everything is just heavy and dark. And I'm just miserable. And it just came to this point where I was like, I'm done drinking. So in this segment, it's interesting. I, I really actually like her metaphor very much. I think it's kind of a beautiful it's a sad metaphor but it, it, it's a beautiful metaphor of this sort of like crawling out of a sinkhole every single day and you know alcohol is a depressant and alcohol can cause depression and anxiety symptoms in people and certainly can exacerbate those components to understand is that there probably 
while she's dealing with some of the impacts of alcohol, there's probably also a pretty decent chance that she is struggling with some symptoms of depression as they already are. So she's likely adding fuel to the fire of whatever she's dealing with from a depression and anxiety standpoint. So it makes perfect sense that this would be how she would be feeling about things. And by drinking alcohol, even in smaller portions, she's still contributing to the problem instead of the solution. Me not being able to have alcohol in social settings was so scary. It was my first night sober without anything. Me and Jordan went out with a group of friends and I just bawled my eyes out. Cause I'm like, I don't feel like myself. What if people don't like me? What if people don't have fun with me? What if I'm not as laid back? What if I'm not as social? What if I'm not as fun? Like I just had so much fear and it makes me so emotional looking back at it. Cause I'm like, girl, you are fine. I'm saying all of this because I know that just me talking about this to my friends, I have seen how many people identify with that thought. So it's interesting to hear her talking about social anxiety in this piece because to be honest with you, I was kind of surprised to hear that she has social anxiety, just given all of her life experiences and everything that she's been through. I'm just a little bit surprised given her like influencer status, but I guess technically for a living, she has, you know, predominantly talked to a camera, uh, but also those like social events. But that also goes to show you that you only get the persona of people on the internet. You can't necessarily always know what they're like in real life. That's why they say never meet your idols because they're never going to live up to your expectations you have in your head. And <clears throat> I think that's it really important here to remember too is that she's human and fallible just like the rest of us and she's also prone, you know, to dealing with mental health challenges and one of those is social anxiety. And I think there are a lot of people who struggle with social anxiety and particularly I think there was an even there's been an even bigger uptick post pandemic in social anxiety because of us being in our homes you know, isolated for such a long time and the sort of like fear of getting sick and all of those sort of things really sort of compounded that. So it is interesting to see um, and hear her experience as she talks about, you know, she doesn't say social anxiety, but that's exactly what she's describing is her social anxiety. And <clears throat> it's really important that we understand if we're people who deal with social anxiety, why we feel that way. What led us to believe that we're not lovable enough, we're not good enough as we are without having to, you know, be drinking alcohol or smoking or, you know, whatever the, the cool thing is, right? You know, it's important to understand because somewhere along the way, we learned that who we are as people was not good enough. And so it's really important that we understand why we feel that way and what caused us in our life to feel that way. I imagine, you know, I've heard Jacqueline talk about her dad and some of the relationship and I don't have all the details. So, you know, I can only speculate here, but I imagine that something about that relationship was probably challenging for her and it made her feel some of those things about being unlovable. And I'm sure that some of the criticism from the public eye has not helped in that regard. So if you're watching this and you're thinking, well, I have social anxiety, that's okay. Just remember it's important to understand why that's coming up for you and what makes you believe that you're not good enough because you are good enough. You are worthy just as you are. And it's important to learn how to love yourself first before you can love other people. So keep that in mind as you move forward. Let's keep going. Very deep feeler. That is one of the reasons that I turned to alcohol in the first place. I latched onto it thinking that it would be my friend and that it would help me to stop feel because I have such deep feelings. That's why I put myself out there on the internet so much. I'm such a feeler and I want people to know me. I want you to feel my heart and I want to help motivate you. I want to help inspire you. The beautiful thing about not drinking is whatever I feel, I just allow myself to feel it. I allow myself to express it because I'm like, hey, I guess this is who I am because I have nothing in my system and I'm not dealing with a hangover. I'm not drunk. So like whatever comes up, I just let it come up. So it's really interesting. Again, she sort of circles back to this idea of suppressing emotions and it's something that I think about a lot. And this, she, in this particular case, she's using alcohol to suppress her emotions. But a lot of us were taught as younger kids, and I think there's been kind of a shift in the mindset for parents now. And as a, as a toddler parent now, you know, I sort of, I do things much differently. But for a long time, there was a sense of this notion of like, well, stop crying or don't be sad or everything is fine. This sort of like normalizing feelings because as a way to help kids cope, parents thought that, you should basically tell your kids like 
not to worry about it. But unfortunately, what that does is that accidentally emphasizes that our feelings are not valid or important. And so we get this idea that negative emotions are not emotions that we should be experiencing and that we should keep those inside of us or, you know, not allow those out or maybe not even have them at all. And so it sounds like in this case for her, she was sort of under that impression of like, hey, you know, I'm not allowed to cry or, you know, it's not okay to be sad. I need to just be happy and perky and motivating all the time. Like that needs to be who I am. And it's really important that we understand as human beings that all of these feelings are valid. All of these feelings are important and exist for a reason. It's what we do with those feelings that matters. It's not that we are angry or that we are sad. It's how do we deal with the anger, with the sadness, and how do we put it out into the world? And how do we deal with it in a way that can be helpful for us to move forward rather than making us worse. And so it can be really challenging when you've lived that belief your whole life that you're not supposed to have negative feelings to accept all the feelings. But I think it is really important in human growth and for moving forward to accept that we all have these feelings and that they all are important. And to validate, you know, for inner Jacqueline or, you know, for inner you, that those feelings are valid and they're important and that you do matter. One more thing about this before we move. I, I did, it's interesting because she talks about sort of sharing her experiences and, you know, being vulnerable. And it's really interesting because when we think about mirror neurons, mirror neurons help us to experience other people's emotions. And I think a lot of people are going to ask, like, well, is this video even genuine? And it feels genuine to me. I mean, mirror neurons are not quite as accurate when you're, you know, across the space of technology. We can still experience other human emotions and you know, we can feel off of that. And certainly if they're experiencing something really heavy or deep, then we can experience that as well. But mirror neurons aren't quite as accurate across technology. So that's something important to remember. But this does feel very genuine to me. And I know that Jacqueline has a history of not always being <laughs> the most honest. But in this particular case, I do think she is being transparent, at least about this part of her story. Jordan was so supportive of me, you know, on the weekends when it was really difficult. We would make mocktails together. We'd come up with all different recipes. I would take essential oils bath. I would be taking all the melatonin. I found all the concoctions that worked for me. Some things didn't, some things did. I mean, girl, I know how to put a horse down now naturally after what I went through because sleep was so difficult. And even if I fall asleep, I'd wake up, I'd toss, I'd turn, I'd be like, ugh, because that's when I was drinking alcohol, right? In this segment, it's really interesting because what she's talking about here is she's talking about replacement behavior. So basically when you're trying to break a habit, you incorporate new habits to improve or basically distract from the idea. And the reason that most people are unsuccessful in breaking habits or like stopping a behavior is because they don't find a new replacement habit. So I think it's great and super smart that she's using replacement habits like taking baths or making mocktails and things like that to help relearn a new habit in place of the drinking because that had been such a habit for her. And I think it's also great that she has Jordan there who's been such a great support for her. And I think support is really important and not everyone is fortunate to have a supportive partner. And I recognize that. And so I think it's beautiful that she in this relationship has a supportive partner and that she has that now to, you know, get her back on track. And if you're somebody who is struggling in this way and you don't have support, that's the perfect place to seek mental health support because therapists and counselors will help to keep you accountable and help you to have that support that you may not have at home. All right, moving on. I forgot something. So, um, you know, she also at the end of it was talking about um, sleep and the impact on sleep. So what's also interesting about alcohol is basically when you drink alcohol, particularly in like quite large amounts before bed, what you're doing is you're essentially knocking yourself out. You're not really going to sleep. And so you're not able to process and cycle through all of the different sleep cycles that you're supposed to go through. And because of the lack of restorative sleep, it impacts the way that you sleep and the ability for your body to recover both mentally and physically. So again, back to those fitness goals, right? She's not able to physically um, improve because her body doesn't have the proper capacity to recover. And so then you get stuck, right? You get stuck because there's not proper sleep and not proper recovery in order to meet your goals and also to feel rested. So I think it's good that she's realizing that alcohol and sleep kind of go opposing to each other. So, you know, there are lots of ways to promote good sleep. There's lots of good sleep habits that you can start. Um, I also say be careful with that melatonin girl. I've read some things. I'm like, eh, it's iffy. So you do what you want from a melatonin standpoint. I, I don't, you know, I'm not... 
I'm not a sleep scientist, but I will say that, <clears throat> you know, if you can use better sleep habits and better sleep routines, you can be more efficient in the long term in terms of meeting your goals. Sleep is really important. Like I need a drink. I'm not saying things like, oh God, I can't wait to have a drink or oh, I need a drink. When I went to Los Angeles, I got super anxious, like borderline feel panicky. And my friend goes, okay, well, what do you do for this now? I was like, nothing. I just let it come and go. And she's like, what? It's never killed me. That was one of the reasons that I drank. I did not just drink because I was like, let's have fun. No, I drink because I'd be like, oh God, let me get rid of these emotions. And that is my promise to myself that I have made. I have told Jordan that, I've told my therapist that, my promise to myself is that I will never drink away something ever again. So basically in this clip, she's talking about like emotional tolerance and the capacity to sit with a negative emotion for a longer period of time. And this is a really important skill. Again, going back to what I was talking about a little bit ago is, when we learn that negative emotions are not something that we should experience or that we should just like move forward from them and like not bother other people with them, we learn to try to like make them move along as quickly as possible. So it is important to learn some emotional tolerance and understanding that we can sit with and be in a negative emotion without allowing it to take over everything that we're going through and be in the moment and in the process. So it is something that takes a while to get good at and it definitely takes practice. And I think that's really cool for her that she is able to do that now and that she's been practicing. And she's like, you know, I'm just, I'm going to let it be. I'm going to let the emotions come as they are. And I think that's really cool. So this video is long enough, so I'm just going to wrap it up here. But, you know, this was really interesting. I didn't actually finish the, well, I, I watched the entire video, but I, I said, I thought I said enough and I'm sure that I did. And so I thought this video was really interesting and I am really hopeful for a re redemption story. Like I am all about a redemption story. I would love nothing more than to ja see Jacqueline be successful moving forward and to reach her goals and be living her best life. I, you know, I'm super happy for her. I think that's wonderful. And again, I really hope for that redemption story. You know, it's, it's hard sometimes to wish well on people when you see them do bad things, but you know, I, we're all human, we're all fallible, and so I'm rooting for a redemption story for her, um, and hopefully, you know, hopefully you guys are too, but, you know, to each their own, and so if you guys enjoyed hearing me wear my therapist cap, let me know, and I can do this again, but YouTube should be recommending something else to you that they think that you will enjoy from me, and I will catch you guys in the next video. Bye.